also when I look at blood sugar balance, starting your day with protein or breaking your fast with protein does the best job at keeping hunger hormones in check the whole rest of the day. So under eating protein at breakfast and eating a highly carbohydrate-based breakfast actually increases late night eating. It increases the three to four o'clock window where you crave caffeine and sugar, and it makes you have more obsessive thoughts about food throughout the entire Wait, day. Wait, so eating a high protein breakfast, they've shown affects the rest of the day regardless. Exactly. So wow. when, when you think about that, when you have a savory or a high protein breakfast, or if you have a protein shake, let's make sure it's not just like a fruit bowl, right? Mm. <laughs> a blended fruit bowl. What that does is it's going to regulate those hunger hormones, but it also is going to support blood sugar balance the rest of the day. Boom, it's mind pump time. Here's the giveaway. MAPS Anabolic, the program that started it all, and I'm giving it away for free to one of you viewers. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Some of you wonder why we do that. Helps us with the YouTube algorithm, just being totally transparent. So leave a comment, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, do all of those things if we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section. You'll get free access to Maps Anabolic. One more thing. we got a sale going on right now, okay? We have a shredded summer bundle, which includes Maps Aesthetic, Maps Hit, Maps Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So it's basically all the training programs and nutrition stuff that you need to get shredded. That bundle is 50% off. Now, if you just want to try one program, one Maps program, Maps Hit is also by itself 50% off. So if you're interested... Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code June50, so that's June50, no space, for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Kelly, thanks for coming on the show. If you, it's, Some of our audience may not know who you are. If you give us kind of a brief background, kind of how you started. and Because when I got on with you, I was on your show. I wasn't super familiar, but I was super impressed with our conversation. You're good friends with Max uh, Lugavir, who we love. And he just couldn't stop raving about you. So if you could give us a little bit about kind of how you started in this space, your background, and then yeah. we'll get on with the conversation. Sure. So I actually had a career in cancer and genetics for about eight years um, and then went back to school for nutrition mm. and did my postgraduate work at Berkeley and UCLA. I focused on blood sugar balance and hunger hormones. And I started my private practice, Be Well by Kelly, as a side hustle. <laughs> and so that was in 2012. And in 2015, I took the business full time seeing private clients in Los Angeles and then in 2016, I wrote my first book, Body Love, which talked all about how to eat real whole foods to balance your blood sugar, regulate your hunger hormones, and feel your best. Awesome. Now, when you when you started as a side hustle, was the intent for it just to be a side hustle because you had other plans to do something else? And then you eventually, like, how did that happen? I was just so passionate about the science of nutrition and blood sugar. I was that girl at parties talking about it. I was, <laughs> I was the girl with my friends, like rallying people to go for a hike. And then I was talking about, you know, intermittent <clears throat> fasting and bee pollen and people didn't know what bulletproof coffee was at the time. I mean, this is way back in the day when in LA, the thing was juice cleanses and smoothies that when I looked at these smoothies were Sugar -loaded a coffee. banana, yeah. a date, <laughs> granola, orange juice blended up, and they put some kind of sprinkly superfood on top of that. And I'm going, wait a second. <laughs> Nobody understands the nutrition here or the macronutrient profile and what's going to do to their blood sugar, what it's going to do to their insulin, what's going to do to their cravings. And so, um, yeah, so I felt like I was beating a different drum at the time when it was really a liquid, like the popular thing was a liquid-based diet, plant-based diet yeah, um, and some type of restrictive cleanse. And so, um, yeah, I just kept talking about it. One of my best friends was like, what are you doing? Go back to school. You know how to read PubMed research, part of my job, my first career. And I'm thankful for the twists and turns of my career because I learned how to read PubMed research. I learned how to look for a significant p-value to look at study design, to look for conflicts of interest, and um, and not to be kind of scared by headlines that were like, coconut oil is going to kill you. Yeah. Red meat is going to make you die. Like, <laughs> I I got to take a minute. And I, I loved health and nutrition. I read all the diet books when I was younger. I subscribed to Women's Health and Shape magazine when my friends were reading Cosmo and doing quizzes. So I feel <laughs> like it was in me for a long time, but ultimately went back and, and started the side hustle thinking, <clears throat> I'm just so passionate about this. I want to help people. Mm. And the first half a dozen people that I worked with were, you know, my 
a friend of mine from college's dad who had a, had a heart condition and one of our best friends who's getting married, I helped her get ready for her wedding. And, and it just kind of went from there. Like I worked with people for those first half a dozen people for free and had some amazing <clears throat> transformations and just felt really positive about it. Like I do it for free and I do it on the weekends and early I get up at five and work out with my friend who was training to, for her wedding and help her shop at Whole Foods. And here we are, you know, I look at it now and that was 2012 and we're almost 10 years later and from her wedding and she's still around the same size as two little girls and being active and eating healthy is a daily practice in that life, in their life for her family. And it's just, I'm like humbled and thankful that I got to impact their life in that way. When did you uh, write your first book? In 2016. In 2016. And that one was, remind me? Body Love. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, we talked about it being food freedom. There were some other working titles, but it's all about blood sugar balance. I wanted to teach people how to support their blood sugar through the foods that they were eating. And I was explaining in this book that there are certain foods uh, that regulate your hunger hormones, that elongate your blood sugar curve, that slow down your digestion. So think about protein. Protein digests at a slower rate than carbohydrates. Now, liquid carbohydrates are going to digest the fastest, like an apple juice versus apple versus a steak. Like a steak is going to digest at a slower rate. Mm -hmm. It's going to be real those amino acids are released into the bloodstream um, at a slower rate. When you start to mix macronutrients, when you add fat, fiber-rich fat, like avocado to a meal, that's going to slow down the digestion. And even when you eat protein and then fat and then your carbohydrates, say something like rice, you're going to blunt that glucose response. And when you're eating a carbohydrate that is cellular in nature versus acellular, so cellular meaning you're having a sweet potato or you're having rice versus rice flour crackers. Oh. The minute you have acellular carbohydrates, these are flour-based carbohydrates, carbohydrates in which the starch or sugar has been obliterated out of the fiber cell, it actually digests a lot faster. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Throw you know, rice in a glass of water or rice flour crackers in a glass of water, and it, you're going to see that the rice flour crackers are already turning into that emulsification, that like chyme that our body produces when it breaks down our food with acid. It's pre-digested essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Like we don't have the fiber to slow it down and fiber is so beautiful. Like I think nature is amazing at supporting our blood sugar balance. When we're eating whole foods, all of the, all of the sugar and starch is wrapped up in that fiber cell. You have to chew through it. You have to digest through it. And then it's being released, passed through the epithelial lining, elevating glucose and then insulin is bringing it back down. Now, when people hear control blood sugar, insulin, they think diabetes, which is definitely true, right? There's a connection there. Right. But when I, with my experience, the most important piece of that is really, you know, working with people's behaviors because it's behaviors that can lead to overeating or eating the wrong <clears throat> foods or not having the energy to be active, which then eventually leads to diabetes. Mm -hmm. So talk about this a little bit. Like you, you mentioned hunger hormones. What are they and how do they affect our behavior? And then what does that mean? Well, first you have to understand how bl blood glucose works and how blood sugar balance works because mm -hmm. hunger hormones can either create satiety in our body. They can be satisfying hormones or they can be appetite stimulating hormones, right? And so when we think about the food that we eat, we don't want to stimulate appetite. We want to stimulate, we want to feel satiety. Yes. We want to feel satisfied by the meals that we eat. And so in my first book, I talk about the fab four, protein, fat, fiber, and leafy greens. And these four things are critical for supporting blood sugar balance because amino acids aren't going to break down to glucose in the way that a carbohydrate does. Fat is not going to have that effect. It's going to slow down the digestion of that meal. And then fiber-rich veggies and fruits and leafy greens, vegetables deep in color, these aren't really breaking down to much glucose at all. So you're seeing that elongation of a blood sugar curve. Now, if you're having, say, something like a piece of toast, you have a piece of toast in the morning, nothing on it, it's a processed acellular carbohydrate. It's going to drive up your blood glucose. Insulin is going to be released. Insulin brings blood sugar down. And if, if the there's an excess amount of insulin and blood glucose goes plummeting, cravings are induced. Mm. So we feel an increase in cravings when we go on these major excursions in blood glucose. And so if we can get that blood sugar elongated and we can start to eat the foods that regulate our hunger hormones, like protein, like fat, like fiber, we actually feel satisfied and we can go four to six hours between meals without thinking about food. And you're 
rolling into your next meal instead of crashing into your next meal. And that allows you to make those healthy choices easier. So things like, for example, um, for example, cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin was looked at. That's a that's a satiety hormone. It's released in the presence of fat, so omega threes, conjugated linoleic acid, and proteins like L glutamine. <clears throat> so, if you're eating a protein and fat rich meal, if you're having salmon, for example, or a grass fed steak, or um, shrimp, or you know, pick your pick your favorite protein and fat. Like, even if you are taking your omega-3s and then sitting down and having some chicken, like it's going to have that effect. And cholecystokinin, I like to tell my clients is like a blanket. Like if you're just having boring, dry chicken and veggies and you don't have any like satiety piece, the fat piece that really regulates and releases cholecystokinin, it's like putting a blanket around. You're like, ooh, that that meal was so, mm. it was so good. It was so satisfying and it's lasting longer. So not only is it slowing down the digestion and elongating your blood sugar curve, your body's now releasing cholecystokinin. And a lot of these hunger hormones and satiety hormones are, look, are looked at by pharmaceutical companies as potential ways to create a drug to regulate hunger. Yeah, it's, isn't there a drug called soma som somatoglide or something like that, that injectable one that- So there are drugs like metformin and Trulicity. What's mm. interesting is the most promising, the, absolutely the most promising drugs when it comes to weight loss. And there's one in phase three clinical trials for Eli Lilly, which is like- a trulicity okay. are diabetes drugs. They're diabetes drugs that have a side effect of, of weight loss. Like the phase three trial Eli Lilly drug is a once a week injectable drug and, and it's in phase three. People are losing 22% of their body fat. Wow. And it's massive. And it's like the best results we've seen. And it's working on glucagon like peptide one, GLP one. Yeah. And GLP one right. is something that stops glucagon. So now your liver is not taking stored sugar and dumping it in your bloodstream. So it's bringing your blood sugar down. It's also an incretin hormone, which means it really tells your body to release more insulin, which also supports blood sugar balance. So it's, it's interesting to me, but also a little bit frustrating that we're looking for all these quick fixes, these drugs that are acting on our hunger hormones that are when we eat whole foods, when we eat fiber rich foods, when we eat the foods that provide our body with the essential amino acids that we need, the essential fatty acids that we need, and we aren't using ultra processed foods, we elongate that blood sugar curve. We naturally have high levels of GLP-1 from the foods that we're eating. We don't need to be injecting like GLP one uh, pharmaceuticals to have that happen, right. you and, know. And I wonder what the what the potential long term effect would be with injecting that and still eating, you know, a quickly digesting, pre digested, you know, carbohydrate or sugar. I wonder if you know, because the body reacts to those foods in a particular way because it's supposed to, right? It's a it's an adaptation. So now we're blunting that response and we're still eating a particular way. We might end up with some weight loss in the short term, but what does that potentially mean in the long term is what I would wonder. Right, and I, I love functional MDs. I work with a lot of them. I have clients um, who I have amazing amount of just <clears throat> blood work on and they all, are all like lab rats, right? It's interesting. But whenever I work with a functional MD, I love that they're looking for the root cause. Mm -hmm. Like we're looking for the root cause of the problem. And when you see people are have low production of GLP-1, a lot of times they have chronic inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. And that points to the fact that they're probably eating a highly processed food diet. They are, you know, and there's no quick fix. All of these quick fixes that we've seen in the past end up having side effects and problems. And so for me, I am looking for the, I'm looking at the science, like one of my favorite classes in my post-clinical work was um, Food, Mood and Behavior taught at UCLA by Michelle Vargas. And she was a dietitian for, um, for a soccer team in Europe and just really an amazing teacher. But what was interesting is people will take bits and pieces of like chocolate makes you feel good yeah. and that is releases dopamine and that's going to make you feel satisfied. But what was so interesting was we looked at all of them. Like cholecystokinin is one hunger hor hormone and makes you feel satisfied. Glucagon like peptide one that we just talked about, GLP-1, that is going to right, help support blood sugar balance. And then you look at something like leptin and leptin, right, is a hormone that's released from your fat cells that's supposed to tell your brain, hey, 
we're fat cells and we're full, mm -hmm. right? But when we have insulin resistance, when we have chronic inflammation, we also have leptin resistance. And when we look at that as like a drug target, they did it, they used it with um, animal models. It worked in animal models to supplement a leptin like pharmaceutical. And it, the animals got the signal hey, okay, we are full. We don't need to eat anymore. We feel satisfied. But it's broken in human models. Like we are so complex. And not only is it hunger hormones, but you also have to look at what's the social setting because, and when are we normally eating? Because there are hunger hormones that are related to your normal eating times, like mm. ghrelin. Like if you get up and eat at 6 a.m. every single morning, and then you try to get up and not eat at 6 a.m. in the it morning, it, yeah. your body is producing ghrelin. And ghrelin is the highest before you eat and the lowest an hour after you eat. And so- you know, the physical stretching of your stomach is what calms ghrelin. And in chronically inflamed and in research in, in obese patients, that ghrelin's never calming down, mm. you know? So it is it is really interesting to start to understand these <coughs> hunger hormones and know like, hey, what's mental versus what's physical? And the ghrelin piece is interesting because whenever I have clients come to me and say, hey, I really want to start fasting now. Fasting's super popular. <laughs> I'm going to wait and I'm not going to eat until 2 p.m. But right now they're a mom of three and they wake up and eat at seven in the morning every day. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like it's just not going to happen. And it, and it, you may, knowing that it's mental, knowing that ghrelin is, ghrelin is really just sort of in your head a little bit and that we work to move that, move that time back, but we don't force it overnight. And we don't say 2 p.m. is going to be the best time for you to eat. I may say, hey, you want the benefits of intermittent fasting? Let's eat like my grandma. Can you eat breakfast at 9 a.m. instead of at 7 a.m.? And can you finish dinner by 5 or 6 p.m. and just eat in the daylight hours? But to get from 7 to 9, I may push it back 30 minutes every single day and have them know mentally it's almost like sleep training a baby or like yeah. <laughs> pushing yourself for something that just a little bit of time uh, every day, like everyone can do 30 minutes, just push back 30 minutes, yeah. then eat, just push it back 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, I also, um, cause people eat because they have cravings and hunger, but they also eat because they have bad feelings. I, I see this all the time with clients. So irritability or I just don't feel good or whatever. Stress. Do nervous. these, do these these highs and lows with blood sugar and do these other hunger hormones besides causing cravings. Can they also just make you feel crappy? Because I do, oh, yeah. I see this all the time with, I used to see this all the time with clients. It's like, you know, I see this for myself. I, this happens to be when I'm bored, I want to eat. Yeah. So what about how they make you feel aside from the cravings? Well, you have to remember that any type of highly palatable food that has carbohydrates, sugar, fat, all wrapped into one is going to release dopamine. It's going to make us feel good. So it is absolutely normal. And I tell my clients, I, I empathize with them. I'm like, I get it. Like you're having a bad day. You're stressed. You're bored. You're looking for a way to distract yourself. Like mm -hmm. it is normal to want to have processed foods. Now, if you've had processed foods, you've gone up that roller coaster on average, your blood sugar is going up for 90 minutes and since <clears throat> being released and you're dropping down for 90 minutes, that crash can make us fear, feel irritable. It can impede our ability to concentrate and learn. So we even see this in, in the research with children, which mm. is why I'm so adamant that parents learn how to support blood sugar balance in their kids, to serve up protein-rich meals, to serve up nutrient-dense meals, to really watch sugar and processed foods. Like before the, the today's podcast, we were talking about it. You know, when you have kids, it's you don't want to make them feel left out, but you also, you are responsible. You need to be in the adult in the room to support help support their blood sugar balance because they love sugar, right? And that crash is absolutely going to impact their ability to learn and retain the information that they're learning. And it also unfortunately causes attention deficit disorder like behaviors. And that can be a misdiagnosis based on blood sugar dysregulation. Wow. So it impacts everything. From yeah, you, know, you know how frustrating it was <clears throat> to, you know, obviously being in the space, I've been in the space for over two decades and to hear doctors say, um, oh, or even studies, oh, sugar doesn't cause kids to act crazy or whatever. I'm a parent. I'm like, yeah, it does. See you immediately. <laughs> oh yeah. I see my kids. If they eat a bunch of sugar about an hour later, an hour and a half later, um, I don't want to be around them or, you know, on the drive home from the birthday party and they're having total meltdowns. It was really frustrating to hear uh, medical professionals say, no, that doesn't, that's not, that's well, not you're, you're alluding to something I wanted to ask her about. Um, 
Because I, Kelly, when I went through all your content, one of the things I really enjoyed was I, lo I love the way that you communicate a lot of the science, very similar to like what we've been communicating on this podcast for a long time. I don't know, it was like maybe six years, six or seven years ago when we came out and we, <laughs> we had shirts made that said IIFWM sucks. And uh, we, we stirred up a lot of controversy about that because at that time it was getting really popular. And this is kind of some of the stuff that we were talking about that we didn't like about it. And one of the challenges is there are a lot of PhDs on the other side that want to make this argument about a calorie is a calorie and is, you know, as long as your, your calories are controlled, then weight loss or building muscle, we can do all that. And we are always trying to communicate to our, our people that, yeah, okay, yes, that's true. But then there's the behavior side and these cravings and all these other things that are feel. happening, how you feel that, why that's would you make effects. it that much more difficult on yourself if there is a, a natural holistic way to make it easier for yourself by just making better choices? So how do you, how do you handle that conversation? Because I'm sure that uh, you get some skepticism and criticism in that direction when you say blood sugar and insulin, you get those people yeah. that eye roll and be yeah. like, oh God, calories are calories. As long as I yeah. eat my 1700, hit my yeah, I hit my macros, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, you know, what's really interesting is that there are some studies that I lean on and I explain to my clients. There was one study, um, Aaliyah Crum out of Stanford. She is a tenured professor. She is a clinical psychologist and she did a study and, um, and it's about what you believe. It's your belief system and, and the belief response. And she gave um, two groups smoothies and she's told one that it was nutrient dense and satisfying <laughs> and really good for them. And that the told the other group that it was, you know, gluttonous, or highly caloric and not nutrient dense. And what actually happened was the belief system actually affected the wow. physiology of the wow. bodies. And what they were able to show is that the return of ghrelin for the people who believed that, or the increase in ghrelin for the people that believed that it was nutrient dense and satisfying was actually further out in time based on- um, wow. fascinating. Then. And so when you look at stuff like that, or like, um, you know, there was a study that took macronutrients, it was, it was published just uh, about a year and a half ago, and it was looking at ultra processed food versus whole foods, and it was controlled. So it mm -hmm. was in hospital set, in hospital setting, controlled for fat, protein, fiber, and calories. And it was ultra processed versus whole food based. And um, what they looked at was feeding behaviors. And so exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about, um, the ultra processed food eating community, and I'm sure you've seen this study, they ate 500, 500 calories We've more. About this one more a day. And when, when you look at that, that the natural satiety that happens, it's this amazing, like orchestra in our bodies of multitude of hormones. And so when you talk about ghrelin, the physical stretching of the stomach, a protein bar versus like pr a piece of protein on some veggies with a starch, if you have a starch, if you're, you know, lean, low carb or keto, and you don't have a starch, fine. Like I don't really care. Um, what I'm looking for is nutrient-dense whole foods that are full of fiber and water that are going to physically stretch your stomach so that ghrelin calms down versus something that's processed and small or um, low in calories. But there is some interesting research around, around belief system too. Um, when someone believes that their diet is going to work for them, so say the guys that maybe troll me on the internet about calories in, calories out, mm. um, your belief system, again, Aaliyah Crum is showing through her research that it plays a big role in how your body responds to the foods you eat. And so if you believe, and this is so key in follow through for my clients, if you believe that something's going to work for you or that you can do it, your follow through, your commitment, and your consistency will always prevail. Mm. And that is going to outpace any fad diet that you do. Sure. So I always tell people like, calories don't count, they backfire. But like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not discrediting the science, but what I'm looking at is human behavior. I'm looking at the fact that like someone can calorie count, but if they start their day with a highly processed bowl of sugary cereal, what are they going to crave 90 minutes yeah. later? They're going to start that that crash cycle and they're going to start craving highly processed foods or they're going to crave more sugar. And then it's going to be hard for them. They're going to white knuckle it. They're going to try really hard not to eat. And then they're going to cave. And it's like, my whole job is to get people out of their own way, to have them stop thinking about food, to have them feel satisfied and relaxed, to roll into a party where there's a buffet in front of them and to say like, I feel good, you know, and not because mentally they're 
they're really good at control because those people aren't having any fun at that party. Yeah. They're focused on controlling their food choices. I want you to f be <clears throat> physically satisfied and I want those hunger hormones to be this. I want the hunger hormones to be calm and I want the satiety hormones to be flowing. Yeah. I think we, we, what people need to understand is that our environment uh, doesn't match our body. What, what I mean by that is we evolved in a particular way and then in a relatively short period of time, our environment changed radically, including our food. And when we design food, we have a market-based system. Um, what people pick food based off of is its palatability, how enjoyable it is to eat. By the way, this is true for all categories of food, including health foods. You get the top you know, five foods in wellness and health categories, and it's the most palatable of all those foods, not the healthiest necessarily. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, they've created, and they, with no understanding at first, maybe now they do know, but really no understanding of how it impacts these, you know, kind of ancient bodies that really were never exposed to these types of things. And so we're, we're, we're just mismatched is what's happening. And there's this kind of this belief that humans uh, evolved to just eat whatever's in front of them because food was so scarce. Overeating 10,000 years ago was just as bad for you as it is today. And obviously it was much more difficult but if you gorge yourself with food, you could hurt yourself. You could you could actually die. You could cause digestive issues back then, just like now. And so these signals of satiety exist for a reason. But we have completely hijacked them and made them so like haywire, right? So mm -hmm. of course you're going to walk around and you're going to things are going to be screwed up for you because your body's telling you to do something and you're trying to discipline your way out of it. Mm -hmm. Which you know that doesn't last very long. At some point. You give in and you're just like, forget it because this sucks. Yeah. And then you pay the, you know, you pay the price. I wanted to ask you about the uh, individual variances. And I know that now we have technology like continual glucose monitors and to be able to really like get more insight uh, into those variances. But also like when you're first starting out and you had clients and maybe weren't using this technology yet. How did you teach them how to navigate through that process and really see how the body reacted to certain foods and how do they navigate and make better choices uh, through that? Yeah, definitely. Well, I love like teaching people how to fish instead of handing them fish. Mm -hmm. I like them to understand the science. One of my favorite classes at USC in my undergrad was Nature of Human Health and Disease, where I wrote a paper like my the my thesis, the end of that class was on type two diabetes. And I thought it was so fascinating because it really opened my eyes to blood sugar balance. And, and so for me, teaching my clients to manage their blood sugar with the, their food choices was really important. And so a lot of it started without technology in 2012, right? It was, hey, when do you feel hungry? So anytime I sit down with a client, I ask the question, like, put me, I want to live in your body. Like, put me in your body. What does it look like? How do you, what is it like when you wake up in the morning? Are you energized? Are you tired? Do you need caffeine? When do you feel hungry? When you eat, what do you eat? How full do you feel when you're done eating? What does your energy level look like 90 minutes later, three hours later? When are you craving snacks? Are you able to make it from breakfast to lunch without snacking? And are you focused? When are your, you know, what times in the day do you feel the most focused? So all of those questions are probing to understand how they're digesting their food, is it giving them energy? Are they feeling full and satisfied? Are they feeling bloated? You know, um, and so a lot of times, especially in the clients that I work with, which are primarily like 25 to 55 year old females, and I have a lot of women who are, I just found myself working and living in LA where I was helping people get ready for movie roles or red carpets. And there's this, there's in this space, there's a real push for, deprivation, calorie mm -hmm. counting, juice cleansing, and things of that nature. So for me, it was the goal. The goal was food freedom and for them to feel their best. So it's really asking those questions around, how do you feel? Because if you're eating a meal and after you're done eating, you st still are sort of thinking about food, <clears throat> I may probe and question, well, how much protein did you eat in that meal? That is actually the most satisfying macronutrient from a scientific standpoint in regards to its ability to regulate the majority of your hunger hormones. You have a hunger hormone called neuropeptide Y. And I always joke, it's like, why don't you just eat more? Mm. Um, because it's from the top down. It's, it's, you know, it's a hormone that cr makes you crave more sugar and carbohydrates. So if you finished a meal and this hunger hormone is still raging in your body, you might not have eaten enough protein because protein is something that calms that. 
that hormone. So I'm always looking for low hanging fruit of, are you going to send yourself up and down a blood sugar roller coaster with this meal? Are you suboptimal when it comes to protein intake? Or are you having a hard time digesting your food, for example? It really, I mean, everyone is different, but I'm looking for the easiest points of entry to get like the biggest bang for my buck. What's what's the theory behind why protein is uh, creates so much satiety versus, let's say, carbohydrates? Is it because uh, in, in nature, protein-containing foods tend to also come along with lots of nutrients, and carbohydrate-containing foods in nature tend to you need to eat more of them to get the same amount of nutrients? Is that the prevailing theory, or is there something else? Well, there's a lot there. So when you look at glucagon like peptide one, um, uh, GLP one, when you look at uh, when you look at ghrelin, when you look at leptin, when you look at neuropeptide Y, um, when you look at glucose response to eating protein and insulin, a normal mm -hmm. insulin response, it regulates the majority of those hunger hormones. It also is interesting because you have nerves that innervate your gut that are scavenging for uh, essential amino acids and they're scavenging for essential fatty acids. So there's a protein satiety theory. Have you guys talked about that on no. the show? Um, there's a belief that we will stop eating as humans when we have gotten the amino acids from the food that we're eating oh. and that we feel the most satisfied by that. That's why and high protein diets are so effective at helping with calories. Exactly. Like you, there, there's no way around the fact that whether you're raw vegan to paleo, somewhere in between, that you have to get essential amino acids from your food and you have to get essential fatty acids from your food. You cannot synthesize these or produce these in the body. And they make everything from our muscle cells to cellular repair, neurotransmitters, hormones, everything. And so I, you know, when I, and also when I look at blood sugar balance, starting your day with protein or breaking your fast with protein does the best job at keeping hunger hormones in check the whole rest of the day. So under eating protein at breakfast and eating a highly carbohydrate-based breakfast actually increases late night eating. It increases the three to four o'clock window where you crave caffeine and sugar. And it makes you have more obsessive thoughts about food throughout the entire Wait, day. Wait, so eating a high protein breakfast they've shown affects the rest of the day regardless. Exactly. So wow. when, when you think about that, when you have a savory or a high protein breakfast, or if you have a protein shake, let's make sure it's not just like a fruit bowl, right? Mm. <laughs> a blended fruit bowl. What that does is it's going to regulate those hunger hormones, but it also is going to support blood sugar balance the rest of the day. So instead of starting with say something that is highly processed, that is dense in carbohydrates, that spike and crash, it's almost like you don't recover. That first meal of the day, oh. especially coming off of a fast, they've been able to show when people fast and go into a high glycemic meal, they actually have higher glucose excursions. They have more um, inflammation, interleukin-6, C-reactive protein is higher. <clears throat> and then when someone has a protein-based breakfast, or breaks their fast with protein. So when someone says, I'm intermittent fasting so that I can roll into John and Vinny's and have a huge pizza, <laughs> I think to myself, you it would have been You're you would have been wrong. better off to get up, work out, lift, have an egg scramble, yeah. and then go have that pizza because you actually would have done a right. better job job of regulating your your blood sugar than if you would have fasted and rolled into that pizza. So fasting is not a free ticket to a high glycemic meal. It's actually more detrimental to your body when you do that. So so how you break the fast is very important. So critical. Interesting. And that first meal of the day can be everything. So even if I don't have control over, say, for example, my kids' meals at school or what they're eating at a birthday <clears throat> party, yeah. you better believe yeah. Sebastian and Tashin are having a protein shake or they're having eggs or they're, I mean, like whatever it takes, like it's the bacon, it's the sausage, it is, I am, it is leftovers. They can have salmon from the night before. I don't care if they want a chicken wing. <laughs> like It's a good hack. Yeah, I just, yeah, like sending your kids to school or sending them to, and my kids are like protein points, <laughs> <laughs> plant points, yeah, <laughs> you know, not to say that we've like totally gamified it, but Sebastian's three and a half, you know, I talked to him and like to educate him on what is in his food, even if it's a little bit over his head, because he, I mean, like most humans, we feel good accomplishing yeah. something. And I'd rather, 
even from my toddlers to my clients, I want people to feel really motivated to put something on their plate than to try and use all this willpower to keep something off. The minute you say, you can't have this, you can't have that, you can't yeah. have this. We talk about this all the time. Yeah. All you want are those things, off-limit things. I've heard you actually talk about how you explain this to your kids. And, and we do the same thing. My wife's really good at this about like carrots good for your eyes and, you know, proteins good for the muscles. And like there's that association. So they know like to seek those types of foods to build up their body. And I think that's like a, a great way to kind of connect all those choices to them. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Same right back at you. Yeah. Like. Being a parent is tough. You want your kids to feel motivated to, sorry, guys. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to cough my way through that, but. Oh, it's all right. Gets me emotional too. I know. I, <laughs> I do this to every guest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo. for Clint. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, right back at you. I think being a parent is tough, right? You like. Definitely. You don't want to demonize foods. You don't want to label foods because you don't want kids to, to seek those out or think that, you know. I don't know. You just, there is some psychology around totally. off limit foods and we have it as adults. So most of the time, let's say we do have those like meltdowns on the way home from a birthday party. I empathize. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, those cookies are so good. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. They make us feel really excited and really energized because it's really fast energy. But then sometimes it's like we climb up the slide really fast and then we're sliding down and we're like, whoa, feeling mm. tired. I'm feeling a little out of control. Like that's normal, but I know what makes you feel better. A little bit of protein. So I may have like a beef stick or I may have like a nut pack for my kids. Um, and I like to teach them to eat their way through it with nourishing things. And it isn't an atonement for their sins. And I talk to my clients about this because there is that thing like, oh, I'm going to, if I'm going to eat that pizza, like I'm going to go work out or make up for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. It's a really hard, it's a sticky space, right? Because you're like, no, I want someone to be like, I'll have fun at brunch, but then yeah, I'm going to get a workout in. Right. It's not, I don't you want you to have the mindset of like, yeah. yeah, you don't want it to be a complex. You don't want to like make up for it, but you also want to say like, how do I keep my pendulum, like if you think of a ball on a pendulum, I always say, I have a client who is hardcore cleansing. There is going to be a minute where she's going to swing to the other side and binge. And I'd rather get her in a place where she can have the cookie and then not miss the workout and then decide to go to the farmer's market and make some healthy food. Yeah. And you're, you're bouncing off the midnight. You're never going to be perfect. The ball is not going to stop. So like this attainment of I'm going to have the perfect day really throws people off because the minute they, you know, have shame or guilt or belief system around something that they've eaten and it's bad, then the whole day's off. Yeah. Now you're speaking our language for sure. Now, what about the difference between men and women? Because we're talking about hormones and although we're far more similar than we are different, mm -hmm. Men and women are different uh, when it comes to hormone profiles. Obviously, men, uh, everybody knows, higher testosterone, much more consistent, whereas women have estrogen and progesterone higher, and those alternate throughout the month, and they sometimes one's higher than the other. What about the difference between men and women and cravings in food? Have you found big differences, or are those not really? Well, I would say gender-wise, when we're just um, making generalizations and what I've seen in my clients, um, women are definitely a little more emotional when it comes to food and we're more sensitive to food. We also, we want to maintain our menstruation. And so we need to have a specific amount mm. of fat to do that on our body and on our frame. When it comes to men, you have higher le levels of testosterone. You have higher, a larger muscle mass, which means you have more ability to manage glucose. You have, That's true. you're going to have more mitochondria that can create more ATP that can burn more glucose and, um, and create and, break down and burn fat substrates. So there is more of an ability for my male clients to fast easily, for example, and wait until 2 p.m. to eat or set their mind on not eating a specific thing and maybe feeling less emotional about it. Uh, so I think context matters. I also think, and this is, a, this is my belief system, that... Um, women are a little bit more people pleasing. And when it comes to making sure that everyone else is okay and not trying to be the best at something or to achieve something, whereas certain men don't feel bad if they're like, I'm going to eat this. I don't care if everybody at the party isn't eating what I'm eating. Whereas women might be more inclined to eat what everyone else is eating to not make someone feel left out I see. or to, so it maybe not, isn't hormone related, more like social behavioral mm -hmm. um, 
generalities, but yeah, I, most often I would just say like men, for men, it's a lot easier for them to balance blood sugar if they have higher le levels of testosterone and if they have higher muscle mass. Yeah, the muscle mass one's an interesting one. Um, so when I when I've read about this, um, one of the best ways that I've seen in this in literature to help with insulin and blood sugar is just to build muscle. Like yeah. I, there was one study I read where they took obese individuals, had them lose no weight, they just built some muscle, and you saw these really significant improvements in blood sugar regulation. So maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Oh yeah. Um, well, when you think about glucose or blood sugar, you eat a carbohydrate, you digest it in, and it breaks down. It passes through your epithelial lining of your intestines. It becomes blood sugar. Your blood sugar goes up. Well, where is it going to go when it's coming down? Insulin is released. Its job is to pick up that glucose and put it away. Think about your tanks. You have your liver tank. That's going to suck up some of the sugar. And then you have your muscles. Yeah. And your muscles are, I think these are the active tanks that suck up sugar. So how do we bring blood sugar down? Well, we don't eat things that break down to blood sugar or we put muscle on and that's tank, right? You cannot change the size of your liver. And if it's getting bigger or like, not, a good idea. not, not a good probably idea. great, <laughs> bigger or fatty, not really great for your health. Right. But with your, when it comes to muscles, like that is your metabolism. Like that is those are the tanks in which you store sugar. So I always say like, if it's not going in the gas tanks, your liver and your muscles, it's going in the trunk, right? It's being mm. converted to our All triglycerides the trunk. and it's storing <laughs> as fat, right? And so what we can do is put more lean muscle mass on. And I, th and for a long time, I think women were really afraid of putting muscle mass on, but I will tell you time and time again, the clients that have the most flexibility in eating that don't have to think about their food as much. They have lean insulin sensitive muscles yeah. that suck up sugar and allow them to decide to have that rice crispy treat at the party or, um, you know, make a more, I mean, high glycemic or processed food choice without, without impact on their body composition. Speaking of, of muscle metabolism, um, there's a lot of controversy around exactly how many calories a pound of muscle burns more in your body. And this is something that we've battled with even on this show, because I think early on, I think I remember hearing estimates as high as like 40 to 50 calories for every yeah. pound. And then I've seen other research that said, oh, it's more like four. Now, in my experience, um, if I could take a male or a female client and add 10 to 15 pounds of muscle on their body, we have dramatically changed the amount of calories they can eat. And it, and it, it doesn't, line up with what I've read. Yeah. And so I've, we've had the challenge. Can you explain that? Or have you, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you have to look at the entire experience there, right? So you're putting on muscle mass, you're raising your metabolic rate. You're also raising the, you're increasing the amount of glucose that that person can eat. You're clearing glucose faster, right? And you're balancing blood sugar at in a more effective way, which is also going to support those hunger hormones that we talked about. When we have elevated levels of glucose and blood sugar constantly in the body, not only does it increase cravings, it increases insulin, it increases the chances of, of metabolic and chronic lifestyle diseases, type 2 diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's going to impact fertility. It's going to, I mean, everything. Mm -hmm. So when we just say, oh, putting on a little bit of muscle is just going to have us burn more calories, it's a whole change in our- How you feel. How you feel, yeah. our energy levels, our ability like to perform in our job and, and be the best version of ourselves. So, you know, I'm not one to fight when it comes to <laughs> the calories burned for a pound of fat, three to five, or a pound of muscle, right. 40 to 50. Yeah, yeah. I look at that and I say, you've increased someone's metabolic health and longevity. Not only that, but every single time that they are activating those muscles, they're releasing myokines, which are, you know, those are anti-inflammatory chemicals that are released from the muscle after three minutes of muscle contraction mm -hmm. that are amazing for the body. So when you think about that, it's counteracting these cytokines are these inflammatory chemicals that are all in the body. So I think, I mean, there, it, no doubt in my mind that putting on muscle is one of the best ways to support blood sugar balance. And we also know that movement after a meal, even movement before a meal or after a meal, if you want to have yeah. a glucose excursion is one of the fastest and best ways to bring glucose down. Right. Yeah, go to, for a walk after eating. Yeah. Tag it to store as, as energy and to store as glycogen in the muscle versus 
having that blood sugar elevated for the long haul overnight, whatever the case may be, causing inflammation, waking up with elevated blood sugar. Now you have cravings. Now you're setting yourself up for potentially having all these chronic lifestyle diseases. And most doctors aren't talking, especially to women, in when your fasting blood sugar is in the 90s, you're doubling your chances for Alzheimer's. And Max and I talk mm. about that. You know, we talked about that on his podcast a lot because it's when we're focused on cardio-based activity as a female and we are not focused on holding on to lean muscle mass, you are constantly going to fight the scale. And what are you going to do? Oh, just eat less, work yeah. out more, more cardio, less food. And then we get to, they get to a place where it's unsustainable. Yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, Alzheimer's, some people refer to it as type three diabetes. So that's exactly right. Yeah. And strength training is actually the only thing that's been shown to, to halt the progression of the beta amyloid plaques from a non-medical intervention standpoint. And as far as the calories are concerned, I've read literature. You know, what's interesting is that you have a range of calories you could burn with the same lean body mass. So if you're sending the signal that you need to build muscle, even if you don't, your body becomes less efficient with calories or more efficient depending on your activity and how you feed yourself. So it's not as easy as saying a pound is right. Well, this many and, calories. and I think Kelly did a good job of touching on some of the other factors that these controlled studies don't bring in. Right. So it's like a controlled study of just measuring. Doesn't how give many you the calories. whole picture. And I mean, and I've talked, I've shared on, on the podcast many times, some a behavior or a, a part that I've noticed about weight training for myself. When I am consistent with my lifting, uh, my knee naturally increases mm -hmm. because I just, I feel better. I come home. And instead of feeling lethargic from not working out and I'm tired, I want to come home and just sit down and not do anything versus I come home and I'm in this mood where I want to help my wife out around the house. I help clean. I do more dishes. Like I'm just a better partner because I got my lift in. And so that's not going to translate in a study that's measuring just my muscle and how many no. calories it's burning, but that's getting, that's counting towards me burning more calories for the day, which is more. going to help yep. with overall. So yeah, we talk about in our experience when we can ha add 5, 10, 15 pounds of muscle to somebody, it dramatically changes their ability to lose body fat. And I know that doesn't line up with some of the studies that people tout out there. And that's yeah, always a the challenge. Long the long, long term, their success rate uh, goes through the roof. What about how our bodies or brains adapt to um, this, the, the, I don't know, for lack of a better term, the sensation of hyperpalatability or sweetness? Like I notice when I avoid um, heavily, like highly palatable foods, that whole foods become more flavorful. Like if I don't eat any candy, for example, or no sugar, uh, fruit tastes much better. If I eat a lot of candy, fruit starts to taste it's boring. more bland. <laughs> yeah. Like what about the what about the science on that and how we perceive sweetness and how we perceive palatability and how it affects us down the road in terms of how we start to perceive the foods that we eat? Yeah. Well what we can point to is dopamine, right? So when we eat highly palatable foods, um, dopamine is released and dopamine can be released in any type of um, addiction behavior, right? So smoking and sex and whatever it is that you're like, yes, right? right. So eating highly palatable foods, you have the release of dopamine, excess dopamine causes a down regulation of dopamine receptors. So then you need more of that food mm. to get that same high. And so when you take a, a break from any type of these, any of these types of behaviors and you allow for that regulation system to recalibrate and then you're eating naturally sweet foods, they're going to taste better yeah. and you're going to enjoy them in a whole new way. And so there is something to be said about abstaining. And I always tell my clients, you know, if you are going to say, for example, try to white knuckle it, let's say you do love ice cream or you love cookies and you buy them once at the grocery store and then they're in your cabinet, you are going to need to say no every single time you open that door and versus just once at the store. No at the store is better than no every time you open Good that point. Uh, open that cabinet. So agree with that. if you're if you don't have to abstain forever, but having those breaks and and creating a system. It's one thing to talk about it. Oh, just don't eat that food. Oh, just say no. But have a system for it. Like we have a system around screen time. We have a system around sugar in our house with our kids. Um, and that comes down to having on the weekends, right? And it it is something where we might get like a small pint of Vetter's ice cream, which is an awesome like little local place down where I live. And we'll get that. And it's made with dates and really awesome. So shout out to them. Um, but we'll have it. And if it's done, we don't keep it around mm -hmm. so that we, Bash can open, Sebastian, we call him Bash, open the freezer drawer and go like, I want this on a Monday morning, right? Like 
don't put it in front of yourself to naturally create those breaks in time so that you can experience the joys of whole foods that you're talking about. And this is the real value, in my opinion, of fasting. I think the real value of fasting is uh, the, I don't know, lack of a better term, the spiritual aspect of abstaining, giving yourself time to deal with how you feel, to deal with these cravings. Then you get these receptors to upregulate again. Then you can, of course, this is, I also talk about this, how you break the fast is very important. Then you find all of a sudden foods that maybe were more bland or more enjoyable. You have less cravings for those super sweet types of food. In fact, I found after a long fast that really sweet foods are overwhelmingly sweet where I'll eat it and get almost nauseous Mm -hmm. from it because my brain has has changed itself. Speaking to the overwhelmingly sweet, uh, in terms of like artificial sweeteners and um, maybe some downstream effects of, you know, behaviorally, if people think that they're not really getting the calories uh, necessarily from these like artificial sweeteners, have you noticed any behavioral uh, like sort of red flags as a result of maybe uh, incorporating that in your diet? Yeah. Um, we haven't seen it in research when it comes to natural sweeteners like stevia and monk fruit. I, but we haven't studied it in the same way as we've studied artificial sweeteners like aspartame with diet soda. So there was some study, there was a study done, um, looking at soda, diet soda versus regular soda. And they gave people a diet soda or a regular soda. And then they gave them a burger and fries and they watched the behavior of the quantity of foods that they ate after a diet soda versus a regular soda. And they were eating almost a third more of the meal when they had a diet soda. Mm. So I think what we think is, you know, your brain is waiting for the payoff, right? You taste these sweet foods, you're waiting for the payoff. It's not coming. (laughs) And then we end up overeating or almost looking for those foods, looking for that sweetness or looking for those calories in the food that we're eating after. So like I said earlier, there's no quick fix right? If you need something sweet or you want to enjoy something sweet, if you can, fruit, natural yeah. can, nature's candy, that's a cellular carbohydrate. It's locking up the, the sugar. It's, you have to chew through it, through that, through that fiber. You're getting all the phytochemicals and antioxidants present there, the polyphenols. Amazing research coming out on how that is supportive of our gut health. Like really cool stuff there. But I get it. If like you need a cookie sometimes, it's just, there, I think there's this mindset that people have that they should be able to just have a box of cookies in their cabinet and be superhuman, never think about it, never eat it, and it'll just be there for their kids when their kids want it, but they're <laughs> going to be able to control themselves because that just is, I think it's unfair. Like you wouldn't, ex- you wouldn't tell an alcoholic who potentially is yeah, looking to be sober to go have a soda or soda water you know, Topo Chico, Perrier, you whatever, go have it at the bar that you used to drink at. Like, that's really unfair, you know? And why spend that mental energy there when it could be spent doing amazing things for your career, doing amazing things with your kid, like productive energy versus, um, I think it's, it's just energy being used in the wrong space. You know, the problem is that we, when we do that, we're in a motivated state of mind. Oh, I'll totally be able to say no with the cookies in my cupboard. And then you're not always going to feel that strongly about your discipline and you're going to end up giving in. That's why I don't have potato chips, for example, in my house, because that's my food. That's the one that I can't say no to. Now, what about, so the brain models itself a little bit when you expose it to a lot of dopamine, but as you be, when you're an adult, your brain isn't quite as plastic as when you're a child. Do we have any research showing how there may be some like bigger or more permanent changes to a child's brain when they're exposed to lots of these foods versus an adult? Like, are there anything that, like, like, do we see anything from you eat a lot of sugar as a kid versus just when you eat it as an adult? Well, it is really interesting that most parents will say, my kids can handle a lot of sugar. They, but what they're thinking of there, what they're, what they're looking at is that, that their child can eat sugar without metabolic impact, without gaining weight right. or, but they're not looking at their ability to learn, retain information. Um, They're not looking at their microbiome development. A child's microbiome, there's something called the first 1,000 days. And this is the most critical time Mm. from when a child is growing in utero through the first, you know, from, from literally egg and sperm coming together to create an embryo in the, from there to the first 1,000 days, how critical it is Mm. for that child, whether 
it's still growing in the mom or out in the world to have access to the most nutrient dense foods and to be protected from endocrine disrupting chemicals, from pharmaceuticals like antibiotics. And, and obviously antibiotics are life-saving when needed, but it is such a critical developmental period of the brain and the microbiome and the body in general that we want to protect that as much as possible. So steering clear of things that break down the body and really focusing on the most nutrient dense brain building and bodybuilding foods is critical. Yeah. So when when my wife was pregnant with my son, we we she ate a lot of egg yolks. She ate uh, salmon roe a lot. We had some organ meats. Were we on the right track? Are these are these a lot of the good foods? You're making me so happy. Okay, right good. Now. All right, right, great, great. Yeah. Yes. Any other foods that you recommend for somebody who's uh, we're pregnant now? By the way, this Congratulations. one's Congratulations. Thank you. Very challenging though this time because the first trimester she was like really nauseous, like terribly, couldn't hold anything down. So this is a little more challenging. But what what other foods can we add to that list? If someone's listening, they're they're going to have a baby or they're planning on it. What are like some of the best foods that you can eat? Right. So you want to look for mineral dense, iron rich, um, vitamin D rich, omega three rich foods. Okay. Right. And so those are primarily going to be in animal protein. So you're mentioning things like organ meats, and um, Force of Nature is an awesome company. They do a, a meat blend with organ and liver. Mm. So other so heart and liver, and so. 10 to 20% of that ground is going to, it's hundred percent pasture raised. So it's ground, it's ground beef. It looks with, like, it looks like a pound of ground beef oh. and they've already mixed in oh, all the great. organs oh, and the livers for you. Great. I like have it. never Bring once. Bring down that flavor a little bit. <laughs> I have never, it's not too gamey. I have never once been so consistent with organ meat. Okay. Like, I know, I know how healthy it is and that should be motivation enough, but I'll get a, you know, a liver and try to eat it chop it up and when it's frozen and try to swallow it frozen, I'll try to grind, you know, grind it myself mm -hmm. into some ground beef. It's just, this is the first time I've ever been consistent with my family eating it yeah. um, and not taking it as a desiccated liver capsule. Um, so what you're going to get from that is vitamin A. You're also going to get iron. You're going to get copper, um, all the minerals. So anything that has selenium, zinc, and that is truly in things like your organ meats that you're talking about. When you talk about egg yolks, egg yolks, that is the multivitamin yeah. of the egg, right? So that's your B vitamins, that's choline, that's vitamin D. If you can get a pasture-raised egg, it's going to be higher in vitamin D and omega-3s. So when we're talking about omega-3s, not short-chain, plant-based seeds, we're talking about long-chain omega-3s. Those are the only ones that have been shown, EPA and DHA, mm -hmm. to have IQ and, and, and brain development, cognitive let's, benefits. Let's pause eggs. there for a second. So the short-chain ones, you're talking about when like people will take like plant-based omega-3s or whatever, or plant-based fatty acids. I think where you need to be careful is the short chain fatty acids from plants like flax seeds, there you chia go. seeds. Yeah. You're going to see it on the side or like anything that uses canola oil, right? That you're going to see like rich, you know, like uh, I'm thinking of like Hellman's mayonnaise. It's going to say rich yeah. in omega-3s. And you're like, that's short chain omega-3s. Your body needs to take those and needs to convert them to a long chain uh -huh. omega-3. And we do a really poor job of doing that. Only of all those short chain omega-3s that we ingest, we're really on average, depending on it changes between a male and a female, but on average, it's like five to 10% of those are being huh. converted to long chain omega-3s. So if someone is 100% plant-based, I absolutely recommend they're taking an algae-based omega-3. That's the only plant-based long chain omega-3. It has to be taken in supplement form. Did not know. Now, when it comes to long chain omega-3s, these are, what's so cool is chickens, they eat those flax seeds. They're pretty good at converting that short chain to a long chain. So oh. their egg yolks are going to be rich in those long chain yeah. omega-3s, right? Um, and the same goes for most of the animals that you're eating, whether like you can think about um, a pasture-raised cow, like the omega-3s present in there are going to be long chain. And in fish, salmon, salmon roe, really dense in those. So those are amazing sources of long chain omega-3s. Now you could take a fish oil, you could take krill oil um, and all of that. And those are going to be the long chain omega-3s. But mm. just do not get sold if you're at a grocery store and you see like flax oil and you're like, I'm going to add that to the top of my oatmeal or in my smooth. That's not. That's like 5% of that's going to get. That's not. Out. That's a waste of your money. You're just pour it down the drain. Speaking of the omega-3s and pouring out down mm. the drain, I've heard that if like, let's say you have like a really poor diet, fast food, processed foods like crazy, and then you take these omega-3s, 
that the sixes and nines outcompete the threes and you don't even get the benefits of the threes. Is that true? Well, when you look at when you look at what it's supposed to be on a cellular level, I'm sure you guys have talked about this. You want a one to one ratio, omega three to yes. omega six. And when you look when we start to look at human studies, it's really like one omega three, twenty five omega six. Yeah. 75 omega 9 like the the comparison and the quantity ratios are really really off so i always recommend an omega 3 it's really hard to out compete those fried foods those industrial seed oils all the things that are fr- your your fast food restaurants are frying up they're I don't say I wouldn't say that we haven't seen a decrease in inflammation levels and we haven't seen an adjustment in in the ratio, when you take omega threes, that's not like throwing it down the drain. Okay. I still think people should be taking those. Okay. Also, because when you think about cholecystokinin that we talked about earlier, that satiety hormone that makes us feel still affects that. It's going to affect that. Okay. So if you don't, if you aren't getting any source of omega threes, so still value in that. It's there's value there, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Mm. Now, what about uh, what, one other thing that eggs contain, which was demonized for a long time, but now we're we're you know, realizing it's not so bad is dietary cholesterol. Mm. And I know that's like one of the like building blocks of hormones and it's super, super uh, dense in the brain. And so this is one of the other reasons why my wife would eat lots of egg yolks while she's pregnant is because we're developing a brain. Like what about that? Is that something important to you want to consume, especially during pregnancy? Absolutely. I mean, when you're thinking about things like choline, cholesterol, omega threes, like these, these are critical for the body and cholesterol is really interesting in that it does support hormone production. And when is a critical time to think about hormone balance? Yeah. Fertility Mm. and pregnancy. And also I think it's being demonized because we're not recycling our cholesterol. When you think about getting rid of old cholesterol, the old cholesterol that is corrosive, that is being demonized. Like if we're going to the bathroom every single day, your job, the job of your body is to recycle old cholesterol and to poop it out and to get rid of it. And if we're not going to the bathroom because we're having a highly processed food diet and we are, and you also want to think about how cholesterol works, right? So if someone, if you look at someone's triglyceride levels and their cholesterol ratio, a lot of times their triglyceride levels are a reflection of what the last 72 hours of eating look like. Mm. Did it look like a highly processed high fructose added sugar three-day binge, if it did, you're probably going to have elevated triglycerides because your body is trying to manage all of that elevated glucose. It's looking for places to store. It's going to put it in your liver. It's going to put it in your muscles. There's no space left. It's got to package it up as a triglyceride, kick it out into your bloodstream. And then cholesterol is the Uber vehicle that drives that triglyceride around. So a lot of that cholesterol is not going to be recycled in the right way. Mm. And it then becomes corrosive. But when we're eating a really whole food forward diet, we're eating a high amount of fiber. I mean, there's really interesting, there's some really interesting research and I, I have to give credit to Seed, which is a probiotic company. We work with them. Love them, Boy, by the way. All our, plugging all our companies today. That's the, that's the best <laughs> I swear probiotic. we didn't know this going into this. <laughs> yeah. I've never used a probiotic so effective as that one, by the way. It's, a, it's incredible. Well, thing. they have some amazing research showing that it, and that they are in trials to show that it improves cholesterol ratios. Yeah. So it is. we have to remember that our microbiome is playing a critical role in, in keeping balance when it comes to cholesterol and that we, we can't just think of these chemicals or um, I want to call them like blood markers mm-hmm. as bad for you or good for you. Okay. Okay, interesting. Now, maybe a bit of a left turn, but um, wait, wait, wait! Don't take left turn yet. Then I want to keep her. Yeah, I want to stay where you're at right now because you're you're. So okay, uh, we're actually in the uh, middle of trying to have uh, another baby right now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know from you uh, how does your nutrition change from trying to get pregnant, being pregnant, and then post pregnancy? Is it consistently the same, or does it change? Well, you always want to focus on blood sugar balance and nutrient density. That said prenatal nutrition is it's really important to focus on i don't always like to say focus on the things you want to remove but when you when you think about trying to get pregnant the development or the, for your sperm for example it takes 72 days to develop 
sperm. And people think, oh, I just, I'm going to eat healthy for a week and then we're going to go for it. Oh, right? so it's what he ate 72 days ago. It's the, yeah. So we call it trimester zero or the primester. It's oh, three wow. months leading up to, to conception. It's critical for egg development and sperm development. And so what you want to do in this period of time is you want to focus on antioxidants. So there's an amazing company called We Natal and it has a prenatal for men and a prenatal for women. And what that's going to do is make sure that your nutrient density so you have your vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin C, but that they're, they also are going to give you some antioxidants like CoQ10, right? And, and what that's going to do is it's going to give you the nutrition or the nutrients you need to fight oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is what, you know, breaks down cells. It also mm. breaks down eggs and it breaks down sperm. So if you have the antioxidants or the phytochemicals to fight reactive oxygen, oxygen species or, you know, the things that break our body down, it's almost like armor. You're protecting your sperm and your wife is going to protect her eggs by loading up on this. Now, as you move into the first trimester, you don't want to be taking loads of antioxidants because that is, they're active in nature. You really want to focus on nutrient density. You want to focus on blood sugar balance because once your wife gets pregnant, then in the beginning, first trimester, you could feel nauseous, right? And nausea is exacerbated by glucose excursions. Yeah. So even though you have, someone might have food aversions, they don't want to eat animal protein. They, all they want are crackers or bread. They go to reach for those things, those fast car acellular carbohydrates, take them on a blood sugar roller coaster and that crash. And it gets worse. Doubles down on their nausea. Yep. So I always say, is there a way? I get it. Like I wrote a whole pregnancy course on this because I think it's important for people to understand how to focus on nutrient density. First, how to protect their fertility mm -hmm. and the quality of egg and sperm in, in their body, depending on the, if they're male or female. Then it's like, how do we get through trimester one? Also knowing that a lot of it has to do with how she ate in trimester zero yeah. or in the primester because your body is relying on those nutrient sor stores in your body. And so in the first trimester, we don't, they may, you may not feel like eating loads of veggies and new antioxidant rich foods and grounding foods may feel better. So I always say, can we find a way to have a little bit of protein? Maybe it's an egg taco, scrambled eggs in a siete tortilla. It's a little bit more of a low glycemic hit. Or if you're having triple fermented sourdough or a paleo style almond flour toast, can you slather on some avocado, throw an egg on top? If there's no egg, okay. How are we getting protein in or bland proteins? This is where I might lean on dairy or I might not use dairy a lot with clients. The it's amazing for vitamin D, calcium, and um, minerals too. So you may use a bland cold cottage cheese or a plain Greek yogurt as a way to get a good quality protein in to support that blood sugar balance so that we're not riding that roller coaster, even when we maybe don't feel like everything kind of sounds gross. Yeah, we did that. We, we led into, I mean, well, we weren't necessarily trying, but we knew we would eventually. And so my wife ate a particular way leading into, and then we had this first trimester, which was just, she was just throwing up all the time. But I think we, we protected ourselves a little bit with the, you know, leading into actually this isn't a left turn anymore. You brought up, you know, fertility and sperm. Um, creatine is a supplement that, you know, people in, you know, in fitness have been taking for a long time. It was for building muscle. Now we're yeah. seeing it's got health benefits. It fuels mitochondria, it improves sperm sperm motility. Mm -hmm. Like, are, what do you, what do you, are you up to date with any of the new research or do you recommend it to people uh, to use as well? You know, I have, I have client male clients that have used creatine in the past and are currently using it. I am not, I'm not up to speed on sperm motility with creatine mm. use. I'd have to look into that research. Um, but we do know that even having just critical, like, um, baseline levels of vitamin D and, antioxidants like CoQ10 and mm -hmm. vitamin C to promote testosterone. Anything that's going to promote testosterone levels is going to improve sperm quality okay. and motility. Okay. So testo a good testosterone, good fertility, typically mm -hmm. is what we're looking at. Most so often. now what about when we lead into post and breastfeeding and things like that? Yeah. I would imagine there's things that you might kick up. Like I remember we had success with the sodium, like increasing, like we use. Oh yeah. That's Jessica too. She drink, she would drink the element. Tea. Yeah. yeah. She was producing more milk. Well, what's so interesting. Um, so that is, a company that I invested in. I've been friends with Rob Wolf for a long time and this, his co-founder, James. And I just, it, 
it's such a beautiful product because they think in a market where you have things like Gatorade yeah. or other powdered electrolytes that are loaded with glucose levels, um, most of us don't realize that we have suboptimal levels of sodium and that we are dehydrated. And and women think, and I think men too, like I'll just drink 120 ounces of water today, but they don't have the electrolytes to hold that hydration in their cells and hold it in their body. And one of the number one reasons that a woman is sent to be induced in her third trimester is low amniotic fluid. Mm. And low amniotic fluid can be for prevented with proper hydration. And so for me, I drank Element in my pregnancy and especially towards the end. And it really helped with fluid retention. You think oh. that it would cause you to have cankles or <laughs> retain so much fluid, but it made me feel amazing. And it plummeted my cravings. And anytime I got an ultrasound in the, my third trimester and the women who've been in my pregnancy course feel the same way is it, my amniotic fluid levels were great. Oh, and wow. so that's where your baby is floating around in amniotic fluid. And then in postpartum, when we think about when you think about a milk production, yeah. right? It's going to be- That's how we used it. So I didn't know that. Oh yeah. I'm still breastfeeding and I'm still drinking it. Yeah. So, and I actually forgot it this morning and was like, oh. We have some here. I, I'm going to get <laughs> yeah, some before yeah. I go then. Yeah. I literally shook some salt into, into my water at the airport um, because that's how much I notice a difference in- everything from the way that I feel to my ability to focus and feel my best, like energetically. Yeah. What about the, like, cause you, when you're pregnant, you have increased blood volume, which would make me think you probably need more, even more sodium to kind of offset that a little bit. Is that true? Or am I just making that up? Well, I think what you want is you, you have increased blood volume. You want to maintain that increased blood volume. And you also don't want to be dehydrated. What I think people don't realize is when you think of it, I always say like, if you have balsamic vinegar and then you have balsamic reduction, what's happened there? you've just evaporated some of the water. Yeah. Like it, and that you can think about that, like blood sugar. If you're not properly hydrated, your, your milligram per deciliter of blood sugar is actually higher. So oh, wait a minute. So dehydration, you have worse blood sugar then as yes. a result. Wow. I didn't, that's, that makes total sense. Exactly. So for me, it, one properly, when someone is properly hydrated and they have the electrolytes that they need. They have the sodium that they need. They're going to have less cravings for sugar and they're going to feel more energetic. Then when you think about blood sugar in the body, like in, in your body that needs to be regulated, you're actually technically you're decreasing milligrams per deciliter because you're increasing the amount of deciliters of blood that you have in wow. your body. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> wow. That's fascinating. So, had, do we see that with CGMs or someone's dehydrated and they hydrate and you see better responses without changing diet? Oh yeah. And you know, what's so interesting is that anytime you have any type of hormesis, right? You work out really hard, you get in your sauna, people will see their blood sugar go crazy. And I get in my infrared sauna and I drink element and I can, I can pretty much regulate that, that so, response. Wow. Okay. So literally what's happening is when you measure blood sugar, it's a percentage of the overall fluid. It's, if the fluid is down or you have less water in there, now it's automatically a higher percentage. Mm -hmm. I had no idea, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Make yeah sense. My wife feels way better with uh, element in her water um, now as pregnant. And so we started using it when she was breastfeeding with my son because uh, she was having trouble with milk production. And it was actually Rob that told me that. Yeah. And we started putting it in her water and she was producing so much more milk as a result. Well, what's so interesting too is the only research we have on this is on dairy cows. <laughs> <laughs> and the when they licks. add yeah when they add salt to their diet the production of milk goes up wow that's fascinating <laughs> yeah. i should have known that i know so, right we, we have the salt we had the salt licks for that you milk cows for you right. and we <laughs> would you would want to milk those, those salt licks so that they would produce more milk that's, that's great right. well this has been a amazing yeah. Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> this is really yeah. fun yeah, yeah. 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 thank you so much. won't be the last time we'll do this yep. again for yeah i'd love to have you back on i think you this is you communicate it very very well and i think you brought us a lot of knowledge yeah i just want people to you know, have fun, balance their blood sugar, protect their kids. <laughs> you, you do a really good job of how you communicate that because I, I actually, and I think what you're communicating, it can be challenging. I think that it gets challenged a lot on the other side. Like I was alluding to earlier with the, you know, IIFYM crowd and the calories in, calories out crowd. Yeah. 
they don't want to talk about blood sugar and insulin. They just want to say, oh, if me, your calories are all the same. We're fine. Or the anti-animal um, product crowd. Yeah. Like anything coming from animals is bad for you, which is totally- But crazy. we always try and bring it back to behaviors. I feel like that's so important. It's like, I mean, yeah. if you, if you why make it harder for yourself if there's a way to, to, to make it easier, right? So that's really- the, That's the key. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for coming on. It was a pleasure.